Can you guys all see it correctly? Yes. Awesome. I think we're good. Okay. The floor is yours, Caleb. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Caleb Malay. Um, I kind of help with school safety, school health, uh, and those are really big topics, but everything uh, revolving around those two topics. Um, my full title is there. Uh, when I first got hired, it was, it was pretty funny. Um, our HR, our head of HR was, was joking around that, that she thinks I have the longest title for a school district employee uh, she's seen. So my title is I'm a COVID compliance slash health safety manager. So a little bit about me. Um, if you didn't know already, uh, I grew up in Brush Prairie. Um, so it's not a, a new area for me. It, it's been great being back in Hawkinson, uh, seeing all the familiar places. It's been really nice. Um, when I graduated high school, I moved to Idaho to attend college. I received my bachelor's in secondary education from NNU. And, uh, and then I also received a master's in educational leadership from Boise State. Um, during that time, I also taught in Idaho for six years, and I was the program administrator for my previous district's uh, driver's ed program. Um, so that's a little bit about me. To start, uh, I'd like to just touch on school safety. Um, school safety is obviously a, a, an incredibly important topic, um, and it involves a, a lot of different things. And so the Hawkinson School District, uh, we are committed to maintaining safe schools for all students and staff. Um, and to do that, I'm just going to touch on kind of the three highlights uh, that we'd like to make known or to reiterate. First one is that all schools have a dedicated security aid, and those aides, their primary job is to secure the campus, to help with uh, monitoring all the entrances and exits and monitoring students when they're outside, things like that. Um, and then we are also part of a safe schools task force um, that a few schools in our area in Clark County make up this task force and we meet regularly. Caleb, I'm not hearing you. Lost him. Caleb. I see you talking, but we can't hear you. He must not be able to hear us either. Mm -mm. Sorry, what was that? Oh, oh. you're back. We, you kind of cut out for a minute and we couldn't hear you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. We can now. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. No, no thank yeah. you. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I was just saying that this year with students being back in person, we had to kind of update and review our comprehensive safety protocols and, and each school, uh, these are the, the typical things that we're used to seeing with the monthly fire drills and earthquake drills, lock down drills, shelter in place, all of those kind of typical school safety drills. And now uh, I'm going to kind of pivot. Um, the, the main part of my job is just revolved around kind of COVID procedures, COVID precautions, and, and this really is the the bulk of what, what I do. So I'm gonna to touch on this quite, quite a bit. Um, so this year, um, kind of in the summer in August, um, the Department of Health put out uh, a large document outlining all of the requirements for schools in the state of Washington. Um, and these uh, are the rules that all schools have to follow and they're specifically around preventing the spread of COVID. So these are mitigation strategies. And so for us at Hawkinson, this really is our, our primary focus around COVID, is trying to mitigate the spread of COVID. Um, and in the Department of Health document, uh, the approach that they decided to take was of layering preventative measures. And the idea is, is that if we layer all of these things together, we should be able to keep students and staff members safe. So the preventative measures are listed here. You can see them. I'm sure you've heard about them. None of them are new, um, but we have universal face coverings. We maintain physical distancing to the degree possible. We increase ventilation as much as possible. We have frequent hand washing, and then we regularly review respiratory etiquette 
um, things like what to do when you cough and sneeze. And, and those things are really important, especially for our, our younger students. Um, we also have regular cleaning, disinfecting and sanitizing of our schools. We encourage students and staff to stay home when sick. And then kind of as a last resort, we have COVID testing combined with uh, quarantine and isolation. And then I just like to highlight there that, that last bullet point, even though it's not a requirement, the Department of Health does recommend and, and kind of state that um, being vaccinated is the strongest uh, protective measure against uh, COVID-19. So now just kind of getting a little bit more specific for what we have at each school. Um, each school has a dedicated COVID response team and the team members include the following positions. There's myself as a district COVID manager. So I work with each school. We have a building administrator. We have a school nurse and an attendance secretary. And so those uh, three people plus myself, we work together and we respond uh, to any COVID situation. So this could be um, if a student tests positive or if a student is identified as a close contact or if a student or staff member has COVID-like symptoms. So sore throat, headache, things like that. Um, and this process, uh, we're constantly learning, we're constantly adapting. The guidelines change frequently from the Department of Health. Um, so having these teams kind of helps us make sure that we're staying current with the procedures and guidelines and recommendations. And it helps us to have a, a unified approach. So the exact You cut out again, Caleb. Caleb, you've cut out. <laughs> he still can't hear us. For COVID related there items. We um, and this website, uh, we, we recently updated our website. And so we're kind of in a delay where we haven't totally updated it uh, fully, um, but that is what the website looks like there in the bottom left. And then for our staff, our teachers and our school-based employees, we have a, a dedicated resource folder for them as well, where we have all of the flow charts and the guideline documents, things of that nature. Another important resource uh, is the Clark County Public Health website. This is kind of the central hub for all COVID-related information. If you ever wanna see the, the most up-to-date information, you can visit the CCPH website. They have, I mean, everything imaginable. They have the flow charts, they have tracking, they can tell you the number of cases in each county, a, a wide range of information can be found there. And they are, that website is actually where we get our flow charts. So if, if you know, a link is ever broken to a flow chart or something like that, um, they can always be found the most up-to-date ones on the CCPH website. And then the last resource, this is a kind of a new thing this year. We have an updated uh, COVID tracking dashboard. And this dashboard has a few different kind of features to it. Uh, gone. Caleb, we've lost you again. The weirdest thing, it goes in and out. Mm -hmm. Now he's frozen. And when you're sharing the screen, you don't really see, see the people. Oh, Caleb, you back? Yeah, can you hear me? We can now. Yeah. Hey, Caleb, oh. how about you try, um, we like seeing yep. you, but why don't you go without video and see if that helps? Yeah, good idea. Good idea. Oh, absolutely. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. Thanks, Caleb. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so like, like I was saying, I apologize for that. Um, our, our COVID dashboard, the first page you will see um, is a weekly total. And so um, you'll be able to see the number of students who are out sick at each school or who are in quarantine, things of the, like that. You'll also be able to see a school year total. So this is kind of the big scary numbers, um, just totals, total number of students who have tested positive, staff who have tested positive, um, and then you'll be able to see a daily tracker as well. So if you're curious 
how many students at the middle school are um, in quarantine. You'll be able to see that on a daily basis. So this dashboard, it, it's updated regularly. Um, and uh, it, again, it can be found on our website. And then the next thing I'd like to touch on, this is kind of a big new thing that uh, people around the district have began to talk about and put information out. Um, we, we are gonna, going to, in the near future, I don't have a set date yet, we are going to begin offering free, actually free, uh, voluntary COVID testing to students and staff. We, we know that there's quite a burden when a student is sick and they have to go receive a COVID test or a staff member sick. That, that produces quite a, a stressful situation for families. Um, and, and there is no easily accessible COVID testing in, in Hawkinson. So to kind of help alleviate that, we will be offering uh, testing here in the district. Um, our plan right now is to offer testing at one location. Um, and we will be offering both the rapid test and the more accurate molecular PCR test. Um, and the, the goal with this new program is really to try and get our students and staff members back into the classroom as safely and as quickly as possible. And so in the very near future, there'll be more information being put out about this, where you can go to get the testing, um, how to make an appointment, what's involved with the testing, things like that. So that's kind of a big new thing that's coming that we're really excited about. Hey, Caleb, could you please speak to two things about testing, Absolutely. Um, the, the funding of that opportunity? And then you had talked about, you know, we have this layered approach to precautions and how you might be using this um, as a supplementary precaution or something like Corey McHenry's band trip. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So the, the first thing that Superintendent Marshall mentioned is uh, the funding for this program. So the, the Department of Health um, has a grant available to school districts to help pay for testing, uh, really anything around testing. That could be uh, personnel, it could be PPE, it could be the facility, the tests themselves. And so I applied for this grant and we were approved. And so that is where the funding is coming from. And so with this grant, we'll be able to kind of fully fund this new program. Um, and so again, it's, it's a, a, we're really excited. It's gonna, it's gonna help the, the stress around COVID testing uh, in the Hawkinson community. Um, and then the second thing Superintendent Marshall mentioned is how we're gonna be using this as kind of a supplemental um, layered approach or preventative measure. Um, so with students being back in school, uh, all of the kind of traditional school things are beginning to happen again. So things like band trips um, or fall athletics, things like that. Um, those types of things have specific requirements from the Department of Health. One of them being testing. So we have our band, as everyone knows, is fantastic. And they are gonna be going on multiple overnight trips. And so to kind of help keep our students safe on those overnight trips, we will have testing available for students so that we know everyone who's attending this, this uh, event is COVID negative. So it, it kind of helps mitigate the spread when students are off site. Um, we'll also be using testing for, for winter athletics. Um, the Department of Health has some guidelines around uh, testing requirements for things like basketball and wrestling. Um, so those are two kind of uh, additional preventative uh, steps around COVID testing. And then this is just my contact information. Um, my email is there, my phone number is there with my extension. Um, if you ever can't reach me by phone, if you just leave a message, I will get back to you as uh, soon as I can. So yeah, thank you for your time. I appreciate uh, this opportunity and, and I'm happy to take some questions now if there are any. This experienced some pretty significant financial challenges over the past three years. Um, they were kind of already present and then COVID kind of exacerbated them. <laughs> and so 
um, when we talk about Caleb and we talk about this testing opportunity, those are both funded um, with, I would say, essentially grant money. Um, the first is federal dollars, um, part of the ESSER program. And that was basically, um, I think it was Secondary and, ed and Elementary Excellence Act or something like that related to Recovery Act. And then, um, and then the D Department of Health in Washington created these, uh, this additional pile, uh, pot of money to go toward um, testing programs in school districts. So the, these two um, important people and program um, were not budgeted for, and um, we were able to offer them through some creativity and persistence. And so we're really excited Caleb's here and then Caleb went out and found some additional resources. So that was great. Um, I say this because it's a good segue into um, Aaron's presentation. Aaron enters uh, the Hawkinson School District as we are in our third consecutive year of program reductions. Um, and uh, we're still not entirely balanced, but Aaron is doing a heroic job of, of getting acquainted with the Hawkinson School District itself, as well as its finances. Um, and I think in short order, he's really gonna have a good grasp of it. And um, he's gonna be a great resource to us because he brings a totally different perspective to um, school finance. So Aaron, um, I'm gonna let you have the floor to deliver a short overview of budget in the Hawkinson School District. I think you're still muted, Aaron. I, I guess that helps. I unmute myself. <laughs> All right. Can everybody see the screen? Okay. Yep. yep. All righty. Uh, we'll just skip by the title page. Um, if I can. There we go. So uh, just to kind of start off, we'll look at just what uh, Hawkinson's budget looks like as a whole. Uh, this pie chart is pretty uh, good visually to kind of give you an idea of where most of the money goes. Um, this isn't out of the ordinary with other school districts or even uh, private businesses, as you guys might know. Generally, um, staffing and, you know, in this case, uh, you know, employee salaries and benefits take up the largest chunk of, of the expenses. But obviously, there are some other very important aspects to this. Um, with supplies, materials, uh, purchase services, traveling, um, and then the capital outlay, just making sure that we're, uh, you know, keeping the schools uh, safe structurally and, you know, as well as, you know, up to date so that they're attractive and they're conducive to, to learning. Um, I think, I think Hawkinson has done a great job of doing a lot with very little um, with what they've, you know, with, with what they've been working with. Um, that goes for a lot of things um, across the board with, uh, you know, with the supplies and materials and what people have to work with, with the, uh, you know, the capital expenditures, the outlay of the, of the buildings, um, you know, keeping, keeping things running on a, a shoestring uh, budget, um, you know, e and even with, um, you know, classified staff, the, the staff that, uh, you know, that help out in the classroom, I think, uh, you know, a lot of them really stepped up to the plate during COVID, um, you know, they accepted furloughs and, and, uh, you know, took cuts to, to make, to make things work. So, um, you know, even our, uh, you know, superintendent hasn't seen an increase um, in his salary, um, you know, since being hired uh, because of this. Give him a little, little shout out as well. Um, here's another good look at kind of the prototypical of uh, the way schools are funded by the state. Because um, you guys might hear, uh, you know, in the news, oh, you know, the state is now really focusing on K-12 and they're gonna fully fund um, schools. Well, um, that's, 
it's true and not true at the same time. It's, <laughs> I don't want to say fake news, but um, it's, it's a little misleading in that, um, you know, I could say, you know, I'm fully funding, you know, my business uh, and yet I'm paying below minimum wage it is kind of, is kind of uh, an example of what's going on here. So here are, here's just to explain the numbers that we're looking at here. This is what, um, based on our enrollment, what the state of Washington funds for just these four examples. So for a school nurse, um, based on our enrollment, they gave us 0 0.15, 0 0.07, and 0 0.10 for a school nurse. We have two school nurses that cover all three schools. And if you know them personally or talk to them, they are stretched thin. And the, this adds up to a 0 0.32 is what the state gives us. And we, we have two nurses and they are they are stretched beyond thin and yet the state doesn't even give us a third of, of a nurse in funding. Um, custodians, we got a slightly uh, bigger bump because of, of COVID, but still um, at the elementary, middle and high with 3.35, 2.10 and 3.18, that's, that's an FTE of 8.63 and we have 11, 11 and a half FTE of custodians. Uh, information technology, 0.87, and we've got 3.4, um, and that's just to keep things going. I mean, it, as you guys know, and um, you know, I'm not too, I'm not too old, but um, you know, I, I remember when I was growing up in elementary school, we were playing like Oregon Trail on the computers and stuff like that. But now, <clears throat> now technology is being used to help kids learn. I mean, they're going to have to go out in the real world. They're going to have to use um, computers. Um, you know, to work. And so just with all the stuff that you could possibly go wrong with your home computer, imagine that times, you know, almost 2000. And so uh, when we've got, when the state's saying, well, for your enrollment across all three schools, you get a 0.87, it's, it's pretty tough to staff. Um, yeah, and then there's their safety. And then luckily, you know, we've got those um, state funding uh, well, kind of a one-time ESSERT funds, federal funding, I mean, um, to help um, with that by hiring Caleb, um, but we wouldn't even be close to, I think it's like a 0.41 that, this, that the state gives us. It's not even half a person. And when you, when you put it into like a 0.41 and, and what we would pay that kind of person, even if we wanted to stay at the bare minimum, not many people would be willing to work, um, you know, as a 0.41 uh, FTE um, and, and stay employed. So that's the, those are the kind of challenges that we're, that we're dealing with. So just kind of recap, if you saw any of these figures uh, from the school board meeting, uh, this is what was approved by the voters of Hawkinson um, for, for levy dollars each year from 2017 through uh, 2022. And uh, this amount here was what was actually collected. And the, and the reason why we collected less is because they had kept a promise to stay at the 1.5% per $1,000 of assessed um, value um, that goes into the calculation of, of levy. So this was the amount that was rolled back, essentially not collected um, on your taxes. And as you can see, by keeping that promise at staying at 1.5 and not going above it, um, they they we basically um, didn't collect that money and that money was was kept in your guys's pockets as taxpayers, the the three point five four so uh, or three point four five so that was that was great but that's also kind of put us kind of where we are as as well here it was uh it was a tough spot to be in for for the board where they made a promise to stay at one point five and then with everything that was hitting. There was some districts that kind of did the same thing that said, we're not going, you know, we're not gonna, you know, go after more. Um, but then when, you know, hard times came, they ended up collecting more um, that was voter approved and kind of broke their promise and they kind of got some backlash for it. But uh, Hawkinson um, did not do that. So, um, just kind of looking at previous approvals and what they would be 
um, valued at in today's dollars based on inflation. This just comes from the Department of Labor and Industries. And I actually, and I even, uh, I didn't even discount the, um, you know, the 2021, I could have increased it by 3% of what would, have, you know, what the value would be like starting in 2023, but I left it just as is. Um, but it's about an average of, uh, you know, 4.059 million dollars is, is what the voters approved, you know, in today's money. So, you know, where does Hawkinson rank with regards to the EPNO levy? So, as you can see, we're tied for dead last, which is good. That means, uh, you know, you guys aren't, uh, you know, having to pay as high uh, EPNO levy rates as some other um, school districts. So, um, you can see there that uh, other school districts also, in addition, have um, other levies, which most of them are related to capital expenditure levies that go specifically towards um, buildings and um, uh, you know an, an expansion. But we, um, I, I believe, Hawkinson had tried to pass one of those previously and um, it was voted down. But uh, as you can see right there. Uh, we are we are tied tied for last, and I believe Richfield and La Center, um, as well as some uh, others, I think um, are going to be asking for different figures than the than the one point the one point five moving forward. It hasn't been officially announced yet, but I know those numbers are kind of getting thrown around there. Here's our uh, current budget and what we are looking at uh, with regards to the expenditures. And as you can see, we are in a hole of about uh, 474,000 in our general fund, uh, the ASB fund, uh, about a negative 11,000, and then um, negative 687,000 in the capital projects fund. So uh, yeah, as you can see that, that you know, it doesn't seem like, I mean, it seems like a lot, but then when you think about the 3.5 million or so that we didn't collect in those levies, um, you know, that would have been enough to, to get us over the hump, at least here, uh, moving forward with everything and all the prices that are increasing and, uh, and things of that nature. So this is where, you know, the board kind of had to make an ethical decision. I think they made the right decision where they were going to keep their promise and not go above the 1.5, even if it meant um, dipping into the negative where we see here. So there's some common questions about uh, the levy. You know, is this a new tax? Uh, no, it's, it's more of a replacement and continuation tax uh, on the current levy. Um, you know what the levies pay for, and we'll talk about this in the next slide, but extracurricular activities, transportation, special education, information technology, ground maintenance. Um, what if the levy doesn't pass? So currently it funds about 12% of our budget. Um, you know, and we'd lose a lot. Uh, total loss of athletics and extracurriculars like music, art, and theater. Um, we'd have no way of funding those. Uh, longer bus times, fewer routes, in some cases, loss of service altogether. Uh, we're required by the state to provide um, transportation for um, McKinney Vento and students with disabilities or students that have IEPs that require some sort of transportation. And I don't think we'd be able to afford to transport anyone else um, if, if we didn't pass the levy. Uh, we'd have larger class sizes because we wouldn't be able to. Um, you know, afford for uh, support staff, help in learning. We also have uh, fewer programs, fewer class choices. I think just that overall, um, it would be pretty dismal. Hey, Aaron, I'm really sorry to interrupt your presentation, but if you could go back to that slide, please. I just want to clarify something for the CAC. Um, as Aaron pointed out, a levy usually accounts for somewhere between 10, 20, percent of um, a total budget. Um, our school board has not made a decision about whether or not or at what level a levy is going to be run or offered to our community. But we certainly expect 
some level of levy will be pursued because um, our current one is expiring. Um, and so that's why um, we're shifting into a levy talk here. But again, our school board at the September 25th meeting, um, they asked Aaron to deliver a lot of this data about what our needs are in operations, special education, transportation, um, and extracurriculars. And so at our work session, and then probably at the end of October, there'll be more and more discussion around levy. I just wanted to clarify that in case people were asking, is there a levy going on? So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, no, that is a good point. Um, so, you know, a lot of this is just based off of what we need. So if, if we were to have a levy, um, what would be a good amount? That's kind of what we're, we're talking about here. So um, it looks like it kind of overshot, but um, you know, the current budgets we have for extra or curricular, uh, IT, transportation, special ed and buildings maintenance are, are listed below. And um, this is kind of like where we would allocate a lot of those funds. And some of these like special ed um, and extra curricular, not all of, the kind of sub departments of those are, are listed here, um, but they, those funds would go, um, you know, towards everything that would be um, considered under those more general departments of special ed, transportation, IT, extracurricular and building and maintenance. And then this is kind of uh, what it would look like based off of those numbers. And this is just a, this is actually just a, a guesstimate because we don't have the final numbers back uh, from the um, county assessor, um, but it looks like it would come in at possibly a 1.85, which would be an increase obviously from the 1.5 uh, 1 uh, $1.50 per 1,000 of assessed value. So what I did here is I put together a table of what it would kind of look like based off of a, you know, a home value that was valued at $450,000 and what kind of increase, you know, that would look like. So on year one, we'd, we'd see an increase about $15.21 a month, um, $2.14 and then $2.21 um, based on a, if, if we were to have a, three years of levy where, where it increased at a steady rate that it had increased before and where the, the home values of assessed value had increased at a steady rate that it had done historically. So with that $15 a month increase, we were kind of looking into, you know, what can we get for 15 bucks? You know, you got two cups of coffee or as Steve said, one cup if you go, to, depending on where you go, right? Uh, a Netflix subscription, uh, about one pack of Angel Soft toilet paper it might not even be available. Who knows? Maybe on the black market, it's worth more than 15, less than five gallons of milk. And then uh, you could buy one third of a Red Rider BB gun with a compass in the stock and a thing which tells time. If anyone knows the movie reference, that's uh, from a Christmas story where Ralphie really wanted that gun, but he was going to shoot his eye out. And uh, so that's really, you know, just to kind of put in perspective what $15 on the taxpayer side would be, but then what Hawkinson would get on the reverse side of that, they'd have all their school sports, the music, arts, and theater programs would be fully funded. The kids would have more class options um, to look in things that uh, were suited towards their interests or suited towards things that they were wanting to study um, when they move on to college. Um, more funding for technology learning, uh, transportation to schools for all students, um, support staff for classrooms, support staff for special education, um, and then the uh, much needed upgrades to the uh, elementary and high schools with regards to our uh, capital outlay. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea, I, I know that $15, it is tight for a lot of families, $15 a month does seem like a lot, but um, it will um, be able to fund, uh, you know, everything that we see here. And even at that, and that's, 
it, it could come in depending on the assessed value. It could come, it could come in at that ask um, of 4.1. Uh, $4.15 million could look more around 1.72 to 1.78. So that number of 1.8 um, is a little conservative. Um, so there's, there's still a chance that that $15 a month could look something like $9.50 or even $7. So, so. Um, but yeah, it will, it will fund um, a lot. For us. That is the last part of my slide, and I can take some some questions. I see uh, Brian has a hand raised, and then there's uh, several things in the chat. Uh, Aaron, if you can open that up and give those a quick look, at, if there's any you can answer.